So I talk a lot about the accessories, the products, the modifications, performance, and real world testing that I've experienced with my Land Cruiser 200 series. On most of my reviews, I talk about products and how they benefit my touring setup for me and my family, and why I choose one particular product over another. Now, as my long-term viewers would know, my reviews are generally positive and I only have good things to say about products. This is because I heavily research the market to find the best product for me and my family. However, not everything goes to plan. Whether it be the factory Toyota equipment or modifications and accessories that I've added to the vehicle, things will and have gone wrong. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about everything that has gone wrong with the Cruiser from the time I picked it up, during the modification and build process, and things that I still can't figure out. So as you know, I drive a Toyota. These things are bulletproof and nothing has gone wrong. So thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next one. Now obviously guys, I'm joking there. However, I'm sure there are some diehard Toyota fans that would like to believe this is the case. What we're gonna do in today's video is we're gonna break it down into categories. And I'm gonna put timestamps down in the comment section below so you can skip between different sections of the video if one area interests you more than another. But anyway, let's get straight into it. So let's start with the mechanics of the vehicle. In Australia, we're lucky and fortunate enough to have the 4.5 litre V8 twin turbo diesel engine in the Land Cruiser 200 series. Now this engine is the perfect platform for any overlanding vehicle. It has 650 newton meters of torque and 195 kilowatts of power, obviously on paper and quoted, but it's more than enough for most situations. Now, although it's not a class leader in its power and torque, Toyota have that long backing for reliability and parts availability. So my Land Cruiser 200 series, well mechanically, it's held up very well. I've owned the Cruiser for over three years now and put over 70,000 kilometers on the clock. As it sits here today, we're running at about 128,000 kilometers on the odometer, but it hasn't been perfect and there have been a couple of issues. So one of the most recent and perhaps the biggest issue I've had with the Land Cruiser mechanically is a fuel supply issue. If the vehicle is left for a couple of days, when I come back to start the car for the first time, the engine will run for about 10 to 15 seconds before running dry and turning off. It's easy enough to get going again, just with a few pumps of the primer here on the fuel pump. However, obviously there's some sort of air leak within the system. Now I've inspected the lines, I've reseated these connections, I've changed both the fuel tip filters on both the primary and the secondary filter, and I'm still having the same issue. It is also something that I have mentioned to some mechanics, however, it still hasn't been diagnosed yet, but it doesn't help that when I drive the vehicle to the mechanics workshop, the vehicle will start with fine throughout the day. Now it has been mentioned that it could be an uh, issue with the injectors with a small gap within the injector seat, which is allowing air into the system and pushing that fuel back towards the tank. However, I'm not willing to spend $7,000 on new injectors just to see if that's the issue. So if you guys have any ideas as to why that might be the case, chuck it in the comment section below or send me a message. I'd definitely be interested to hear what you think. Now the only other minor issue I've come across is a small oil leak from the rear main seal at the back of the engine block. Now I know this is a consumable part and it is part of ongoing maintenance, how I think 128,000 kilometers is a little bit premature and it's gonna be a little bit expensive to fix. However, it's fairly minor at the moment. Now, although not so much of a mechanical issue, the one item I've had to purchase again in the engine bay is the oil catch cam. Now I've got a full video dedicating to how catch cans work, why I've put a catch can into the engine bay of the Land Cruiser 200, and also why I've bought this Provent 200 unit to replace my HBD unit. So check that out if you're interested in that one. But I do understand there are thousands of cruisers out there running with no catch can whatsoever, and it's not a mandatory item. However, if you are looking for a catch can, the Provent 200 is still my recommendation. Now it's very easy to get caught up with some of the rumors and the hearsay on the forums in regards to some of the mechanical problems that the Land Cruiser 200 series has faced. Things like intercooler leaks, low compression values, and dusting. Now although I have seen a little bit of visible dust come through the engine's intakes, and I have put some measures in place to try and prevent that, Toyota still claim it's within spec, and I'm yet to see any damage or any evidence of deterioration in performance. So overall, mechanically, I'm very happy with the performance and the reliability of my Land Cruiser 200 series so far.
So it's time to move on to some of the driveline components. Now, in my experience, the Toyota reputation for its reliability has been maintained for all components of the driveline of this vehicle. However, I will say that I have had a broken CV boot on this front driver's side axle. Now, with no fault of the vehicle itself, and more likely the tracks that I choose to drive, this caused all the grease to be expelled from that CV joint. However, picking it up nice and early, I was fortunate enough to only have to replace the CV boot itself. However, as luck would have it, last year on a four-wheel drive track, I managed to damage and tear that same CV boot open again, expelling all that grease for a second time. However, this time filling it up with sand and water on some four-wheel drive tracks to get out of the area. Now the same CV joint is still in there at the moment, however it is worn and it's going to wear out very quickly. So for the next service, I'm going to be up for a new CV. Now this isn't so much an issue with the vehicle itself, however it's worth mentioning as it is a compromise that we make when driving these modern day four wheel drives with independent front suspension setups compared to those solid axle alternatives. Now sticking with that driveline topic, we're going to be talking about the brakes. Now, ever since I remember picking up this Land Cruiser here, there's always been a small shudder in the brakes, which is consistent with a warped rotor. It's more noticeable at slower speeds, particularly when coming down to a stop. And I've heard other owners talk about the issue, and with the weight of this Cruiser here and how heavy it sits today, I decided to upgrade the brakes and rotors. Now upgrading the brakes and rotors on this vehicle have made a huge difference to the braking performance. It really does stop the vehicle nice and quick and it's eliminated all of that shadow that I was experiencing. However, when replacing the pads and the rotors on this vehicle, we did come across a damaged front passenger caliper. The bolt that holds the caliper into position had sheared from its mount and although it was still present within the caliper, it wasn't holding it down firmly and securely. So when I replaced these brakes, I was up for an entire new caliper in addition to those rotors and brake pads. Suspension. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a reason why I haven't talked about my suspension too much or conducted a thorough walkthrough of the system I have in my vehicle. And that's because it's been an absolute nightmare to set up and get it exactly where I want it after a couple of years of adjustments and mucking around with it. So let's go through what I've got and why. So I went with an ARB BP51 Remote Reservoir Shock Absorber System. It's a fairly standard package that ARB offer and it suits the 200 series quite well, or so I thought. It comes with heavy duty coil springs around struts in the front suspension and I put 400 kilo constant springs in the back with airbag as helper assists. Now the kit comes advertised as a 2 inch front lift and a 1 inch lift in the rear. However my real world results were more of a 3 inch lift in the front and a 4 inch in the back. Now although it wasn't an issue this was when the vehicle was unladen unmodified, it did settle a little bit but still it was significantly higher than advertised. Now I also opted to have an adjustable panhard rod put in the rear to center that rear axle given the height change. I put some new upper control arms in the front to help with the caster angle and I also put a front differential drop just to help bring or minimize the angle of those front CVs. So the first thing that I wasn't overly happy with and wanted to change in the vehicle was the height of the front of the cruiser. The ARB suspension system is designed to remove some of the front rake or the dip in the front of the vehicle by adding a 2 inch lift in the front and only a 1 inch in the rear. Now I know I'm going to get a bunch of comments stating that Toyota designed the front rake for a reason and it's designed to increase handling and performance and I do agree for a stock vehicle. However, upgrading the necessary components and making the correct adjustments, a front rake is not required or needed and lifting the front of the vehicle will increase the approach angle and the front clearance. Now I know there's going to be some people out there who disagree with this, however if you look at the majority of the four wheel drives on the market today, and even performance cars for that matter, they don't have that front rake. It's not necessary for performance, however Toyota did design it for their stock vehicles. Now as you can see behind me, this is not a stock vehicle, weighing in at almost a tonne heavier than a standard vehicle, with tyres that are 3 inch larger and a raft of other aftermarket modifications, we've made the necessary adjustments and added in the correct components to retain the safe handling characteristics that you would expect from a stock vehicle. Now the first issue I came across with adjusting the height of the suspension here was that the fitter that initially installed the suspension system refused to adjust it any further, just quoting a guide from the ARB fitting instructions. This also came from the fitter who told me that this, the height of the front suspension could be adjusted on the fly, demonstrating a clear lack of knowledge of their own product. So let's have a quick look about how they set it up. So with this wheel off now, we can have a better look at that front strut and how it works, so we can go through how the ARB fitting guide works. 
So here we are at the front of the vehicle here on the passenger side and we can see the front strut here and you can see this remote reservoir line going to a canister that's mounted elsewhere and the end of the control arm here. And what we can see here is some thread that controls the height of this coil hat here, which places pressure on the coil just underneath it. The tighter this coil hat is wound down, the more preload pressure that is placed on the spring underneath it, and therefore the increased height of the vehicle. So what ARB do and give to their stockists and their fitters is a rough guide on how to set up a vehicle given the amount of accessories already fitted to it. For example, if you have a stock standard cruiser with no additional weight, you may only have 10 mil of this thread here showing, and therefore that's putting less preload onto the spring and giving you that good two inch of lift. However, if you start to add things like additional batteries or a bull bar, then you may have 15 mil of this thread exposed. And the same for additional batteries, bull bar, winches, and other accessories, you're going to have more down to about a 20 mil of thread exposed. Now, as we measure it here today, we can see here that we've got approximately 31 millimeters of thread exposed on the top of this coil hat. Now, this here is much higher than the ARB fitting guide. However, it still gives you that accurate two inch lift in the front of the vehicle. Now, in the first instance, I already had the maximum amount of thread exposed for the recommended for the accessories fitted to my vehicle. However, there was still more adjustment available underneath this coil hat. So I took my vehicle to another regional ARB stockist and had the suspension removed and adjusted. They wound that coil hat down just a little bit and gave a little bit of extra height in the front, refitting it and giving the vehicle a new wheel alignment. It did remove some of that rake, however it still wasn't perfect and I still required more adjustment. So it wasn't until I visited ARB Wangara in Western Australia that I was able to get some useful and specific information in relation to the 200 series Land Cruiser and that front suspension system. They told me there that yes, the fitting guide is a good place to start when setting up the preload for the front coils, depending on the particular vehicle. However, it's the measurement between the bottom of the rim and the guard that gives you that indication as to where the suspension needs to sit to maintain that two inch lift and keep those valves nice and free and open inside the shock absorbers. So measuring up my vehicle in the car park at the ARB store, we ascertained straight away that my height was lower than the recommended height given by ARB, even though that thread was a little bit more than the fitted guide displayed. So back in it went again for a third time, suspension was removed, wound back up and put back into the vehicle requiring another wheel alignment. So we can see here that we've got about 31 to 32 millimeters of thread showing. And finally, I'm happy with the height of the front suspension. The vehicle sits nice and level and it sits perfectly within the ARB specified recommendations. So unfortunately, this is not where suspension issues ended with the ARB kit. So only 18 months after having the suspension system fitted, I noticed that both the rear shocks started to leak oil fairly badly. I took it back to ARB, who agreed that they were part of a bad batch that had some issues. So once a warranty claim was approved, it was taken back and both the rear shocks were replaced. While we're here at the rear shocks, me, like many other customers, have also had to watch those flimsy plastic shock guards just get destroyed over the off-road tracks and gravel roads, and these ones are no different. Although the new ones are still holding up, that's because they're new, the old ones had cracked and damaged fairly badly, and I fully expect these to do the same. So I'm looking at an aftermarket solution there. However, I'll maximize the life out of these ones. If only that's where the suspension issues ended, but unfortunately it doesn't. Moving back to the front axle again, we have the Blackhawk upper control arms that were subject to a safety recall notice. So I had to book these in, have the upper control arms removed, the ball joint replaced, and then fitted it back into the vehicle. Although the cost was spared by the company, it was still inconvenient, but I'm fortunate enough not to have had any major issues like some other customers reported. And finally, onto one of Toyota's OME stock standard systems that did have a little bit of an issue, and that's the KDSS system and the infamous KDSS lean. Now the vehicle here is parked on an angle, so it's not quite as bad as that. However, there is some lean to the vehicle with the driver's side coming down just that little bit. I have tried lifting that rear left wheel up, resetting the shutter valves. However, it minimized it a little bit, but it's still there. So it's something I might have to rectify with small spaces just on the driver's side to even the vehicle out. But saying that KDSS is still an awesome system and something I would definitely recommend and have fitted if I had my time again. The benefits it provides both on-road and off-road are definitely worth that slight little lean you get on the vehicle to the driver's side sometimes. Electrical issues can be a full driver's worst nightmare. 
Given how much and how often we fit electrical accessories to our vehicle, it can make it very hard to diagnose and hard to fix issues out on the track. And this build here has been no exception. Now the first electrical issue that I came across in this cruiser was after having the bulk of the electrical work done once I started modifying the vehicle. Now although I'm very happy and satisfied with the work that Ultimate 4 Drive Equipment have done on the vehicle, particularly in terms of the electrical components, there was something that I installed inside the vehicle that started to interrupt the Toyota wireless frequency. This meant that there would be intermittent issues with the keyless entry, the central locking, and sometimes the keyless start functions on the cruiser. Now the most frustrating part about this is sometimes it works perfectly. The vehicle picks up that frequency and unlocks the vehicle every time. However, sometimes you're standing out in the car park trying to lock your car for 30 seconds. Now I'm yet to figure out exactly what the issue is, however, it's something that I've learned to work around and get used to. But if you guys have any ideas about how I might be able to fix it for a long-term solution, let me know in the comments section below. Now the second intermittent issue I have in the cruiser again is an intermittent fault. However, I should mention that it's only occurred once, but it's something I still haven't found a solution for yet. Now a little while back, I had another set of wiring completed by Ultimate 4 Drive Equipment, primarily to power three accessories. The first one being a fuse block in the rear drawer system here, which powers most of the accessories mounted in the EMU Wing storage kit. The second being a 1000 watt inverter, which is mounted behind this fridge here. And the third one being a pair of dash cams, one at the front and one at the rear. This wiring was added onto the fuse block that's mounted in the engine bay and the additional wiring that was already included in the vehicle from its earlier modifications. Now when I was on my last trip up to Shark Bay, the system worked perfectly for the majority of the trip. However, the last three days, these three items in particular lost power. But they didn't lose power altogether, they just dropped down to three volt. This meant that the power inside the box wasn't working, the light was dim, the inverter wouldn't turn on, and the dash cams were trying to start and flashing error codes. Now I can't understand as to why this would only receive three volts, so I took it back to Ultimate Equipment, but as my luck would have it, all the items started working once it got into the workshop, and they've been working ever since with the full 12 volt. To be honest, this actually concerns me a little bit more because I don't know what caused the issue, and I haven't found a long-term solution for it. So if it happens again out on the track, I lose access to things like my inverter to charge up my power stations, I lose access to my water pumps, and other accessories I do rely on out in the bush. I'd be interested to hear from you guys as to why you think this might be dropping from 12 volt down to 3 volt rather than nothing at all. Whether or not it'd be some resistance in the line, maybe a tear or some cable quality, but then it doesn't quite explain as to why it's working now and has been working fine ever since. So not having to move very far, and we're at our third electrical issue that I've experienced in the Land Cruiser, and that is this Victron BMV 712 battery monitor. Now for some unknown reason, this battery monitor will just power down without warning and I'm unable to find a pattern as to when it does, whether it would be time of day, the vehicle sitting idle for some time or being used daily, or the voltage is being high or low. For some reason, this system will just shut down, won't respond to any input and won't transmit any data to the phone either. Now I've done your usual by checking the wiring and the integrity of the connections and unable to find any issues there. It does it probably once a month or so and can shut down for up to 48 hours. Sometimes it's just a few hours. So I'm not sure whether it's an issue with the battery monitor itself or the wiring completed by Ultimate 4 wheel drive equipment. Fortunately, I'm lucky enough to have some backup voltage gauges in the front of the vehicle. However, it's something that I've had to get used to. And again, if you guys have any ideas, let me know in the comment section. Now a very minor electrical issue up here at the front of the cruiser is to do with the 12,000 pound winch mounted into the bull bar. This electrical wiring comes straight from the starting battery here and goes through a winch isolating switch. What this allows me to do is completely disconnect all power from that winch so no other wireless controllers can interrupt the frequency and cause my winch to activate when I'm not planning on using it. Now the winch isolating switch here is just activated by using a special key to turn it off and on. However, one of the first times I used the winch, it failed to operate altogether. Now luckily I was with company on that trip and I was able to be recovered by another vehicle. However, it was later on that day that I realized it was this isolating switch that resulted in no power getting down to the winch. It was a fairly easy fix on the track side, able to remove this switch here, bypass it altogether, and we're back on the road. However, the switch here now no longer has any function. Now the last electrical consideration I have to take into account, probably not so much of an issue, is the constant negative draw I have on this deep cycle auxiliary battery. I can have all of the appliances that I've got wired into this vehicle switched off, and there still is a negative standby draw of about 0.2 of an amp per hour. 
So if I store this vehicle in a garage for a week or two, or I'm out on the tracks in a remote area without any solar input for a fair amount of time, the vehicle will eventually drain to nothing, even with everything switched off. Now it's not so much of an issue, but more of a consideration, and it's a big reason as to why I fitted a solar panel up on the Rhino roof rack, just to keep that power trickling in. But if I had my time again, I would definitely consider adding in an isolating switch for some of the non-essential 12 volt gear in the vehicle, enabling me to switch it off when I'm not in using it, and therefore negate some of that standby power. But for the time being, I'm just gonna be mindful of what's been drawn off this battery and how long it goes without receiving any charge. There have been a few little things that have gone wrong with the vehicle over the build, but they're probably more of outliers and not major issues in the grand scheme of things. One of those things would be the bull bar coming loose after installation after a few corrugated roads. Now this was installed by the same people who installed my initial suspension setup, and it's definitely not a workshop that I would recommend or return to. Now one of the other issues I've faced along the build of my Land Cruiser 200 series is this Emu Wing kit. Now those who have seen the video dedicated to the review of the Emu Wing system know that the installation was done very poorly. I'm not very happy with the overall finish. However, I do maintain the functionality of this system is awesome. Being able to use this space in here that was previously wasted is a huge advantage, and I'm still yet to see any evidence of dust or water leaks. So it works well, it just looks messy, and not to mention permanent. Now there is no doubt another issue with my cruiser are the weights. Now from my last video you can see this vehicle is very heavy and I'm sure you could argue that it's personal preference in regards to how much gear I take and how I've set this cruiser up. However, you could also argue the other side with Toyota's unrealistic tear weights and lack of payload in that GVM. Now it's something that we have to learn to live with, we have to make sure we get it right. However, you need to make sure you set your cruiser up right for you and your setup to make sure you stay legal and safe within those weights. So there you have it guys, you can see there that not everything always goes to plan. Even though my reviews and walkthroughs are fairly positive and everything seems to work well on camera, there are things going on in the background that still cause issues and are not perfect. However, I hope you managed to get some good value from this video. It goes to show that researching good quality products for your particular setup is vital for ensuring the best possible outcome and trying to find good fitters with a good reputation can do that as well. Companies like ARB Wangara, Ultimate 4 Drive Equipment in Bibra Lake and Hunter Mechanical have been some great companies I've worked with recently and have achieved some good results. And no, I'm not sponsored to say that. So guys, I hope you managed to get some value from this video and show you that not everything you see on social media and on YouTube is always gonna be working perfectly as it may look. But guys, thanks for watching to the end. Make sure to comment in the section below if you have any suggestions to any of the problems that I've mentioned in the video or maybe share your experiences with us as well. Thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Come on. Now I'm yet to figure out what it, now I'm yet to figure it out. Now I'm yet to confirm what's causing this issue. Now I'm yet to figure out exactly what's causing it is. Now I'm not exactly sure what accessory has caused this issue. However, I'm gonna think. <clears throat> now I'm yet to confirm exactly what's causing. <clears throat> now I'm yet to confirm what's causing this issue. However, now I'm yet to confirm what's causing this issue. However, if you guys have any ideas or maybe potentially able to. Now I'm yet to figure out exactly what the problem is. However, it's something that I've learned to work around throughout. The